Thank you, sir. Um, so <clears throat> my talk is on circulating tumor DNA and just I mean, for those of you who work here too, so this is quite similar. Um, but I have added in some new data. It's not my data. I would like to share the data that I am currently working on and um, I'm hoping to I'm presenting it um, at ASCO, so it's just not ready just yet, but we can potentially talk a little bit about it. Um, so what are the objectives of this talk? Um, I'm going to discuss what a liquid biopsy is and what CTDNA is, um, the methodology of extraction and downstream analysis of CTDNA, the utility of CTDNA in GIST, and the current, uh, some of the current evidence out there, and then future directions. So a liquid biopsy is essentially collecting tumor-derived material from bodily fluid. And the tumor-derived material can include circulating tumor cells, exosomes, or circulating tumor DNA, which we will discuss further. So CTDNA is a component of cell-free DNA. And cell-free DNA represents fragments of normal and cancer cells shed into the bloodstream. And CTDNA ultimately reflects tumor-derived DNA. And the sources of CTDNA include blood, urine, CSF, and respiratory secretions. So in terms of collecting um, CTDNA, it's very straightforward. It literally is a blood sample and taken in a specialized tube called a strep tube, which allows for plasma separation, um, from which cell-free DNA can be uh, extracted and then quantified, and then downstream analyses can take place. So the downstream analyses um, of cell-free DNA facilitates um, the sequencing and detection of the tumor's genomic landscape. And there are many different methodologies to, to utilize um, or use to um, analyze cell-free DNA or CTDNA. The gold standard has been digital droplet PCR. Um, however, with this, um, you do need to know what you're looking for. So it doesn't allow for discovery. Um, other methods used include beaming uh, PCR methodology, and then others include uh, next generation sequencing or indeed then more targeted panels. Um, and so CTNA is a, is, is a potential biomarker for this disease in that it can be diagnostic uh, and also predictive uh, by identifying the kid exon 11 mutation. Therefore, we know that imatinib is, is, is a drug that um, is, uh, is useful, and <laughs> very useful in this disease setting. And it can be pharmacodynamic in that it may provide dynamic assessment showing uh, biological responses occurred after a therapeutic intervention. And then it can be discovery in nature in that it can potentially identify, um, depending on the methodology you use, it can potentially identify other um, mechanisms of resistance that may emerge on therapy. But it's important to um, when we're it's important when we're developing CTDNA in, in any disease setting to look at quality control and ensure that we are accurately detecting somatic mutations. So we need to exclude any surrounding uh, noise from other cells, and it's important to, to note that germline alterations um, detectable, are detectable in both normal and circulating tumor DNA. Um, so it's important to collect and sequence both normal DNA and tumor DNA, and then compare them to allow for unambiguous detection of tumor-specific DNA. And then we should also further evaluate sequence CT, CTDNA samples that fail to identify somatic mutations. Why is this? Is this because of inadequate DNA um, present in the sample? So what is the role of CTDNA in GIST? Um, so in the localized disease setting, I think it has a role to play here um, in potentially helping with therapeutic selection and also potentially detection of recurrence, minimal residual disease. However, I think this is the most difficult area we will find to um, be able to utilize CTDNA because I think our detection levels may not be, uh, they're not there yet. And I think that this therefore is one of the, although it has great merit, it will be challenging in the future. Um, in the metastatic disease setting, CTDNA can again allow for therapeutic selection by um, showing us the genomic profile of the tumor. It can potentially allow us to monitor a therapeutic response. 
and then the refractory disease setting, it, it allows for detecting mechanisms of resistance that emerge on therapy, and therefore facilitating tiny um, changes in our therapy. And it also helps, it is also very helpful to potentially capture the heterogeneity of the tumor, um, and also evaluate specific response within subclones within the tumor. So what informs therapeutic selection in DISH? Well, it includes both patient and um, genomic characteristics. Um, this study from 2015 suggested that less than 15% of patients with DIST have their tumors genotyped. I'd like to think that that number has improved since I presented it in the past. Um, in terms of looking at concordance, several, several studies um, have shown the ability to detect somatic mutations in ctDNA collected from patients with GIST. However, a few studies have reported on the concordance rate um, between the molecular spectrum detected by sequence ctDNA and tumor DNA from biopsy or surgical specimens. There, have been, there was a study showing that the detection of primary kit mutations was high, showed a high concordance rate. However, there was poor concordance with respect to secondary um, kit mutations. This study was recently published by a group, uh, a Chinese group, and they essentially were evaluating the feasibility of ctDNA detection by next generation sequencing, and we're looking at the, determining the concordance between ctDNA and tissue DNA detection by next generation sequencing. It was a re retrospective study um, on prospectively um, collected um, tumor tissue and ctDNA. They included 32 patients with advanced GIST, um, and they utilized a next generation sequencing panel that incorporated more than 16 genes. And ultimately what they revealed, their detection rate in terms of ctDNA um, was 56%, so 18 out of the 32 cases they were able to detect the molecular profile. They looked at, they compared this to prior studies where let's say they suggested that with beaming the rate of detection was 16.7% and PCR was 39.5%. However, I do question the, the low rate that they used to compare. Um, what they did then uh, show was on univariate analysis um, factors that influence the ability for um, one to detect ctDNA. Um, the factors most important uh, to note were tumor size and K the KI67 index, which is the rate of proliferation within the tumor. So the number of ctDNA ctDNA and mutations detected was positively correlated with a larger tumor size greater than 10 centimeters, um, and also with a, KI, a higher KI67 uh, index. In regards to concordance, um, they showed that the concordance rate was 72%, and this by statistical um, analysis was a moderate concordance um, rate. Um, and again, they showed that concordance was higher in patients with larger tumors, greater than 10 centimeters, and with a higher KI67 index, greater than 5%. So looking at monitoring the response to therapy utilizing ctDNA, currently what we have is radiological methods that we utilize in our clinical trials to look at um, the response to therapy, including resist, troy, and persist. And they're all, many, many times we utilize many of these uh, together, uh, but none of them are perfect uh, you know, by any means. In other tumors, we have the ability to use tumor markers as biomarkers, such as prostate cancer and PSA, ovarian cancer and CA125. However, um, many cancer types don't have uh, a, a, a different serum biomarker to use, like just. So monitoring response to therapy utilizing ctDNA, ctDNA and just what are the advantages of this? It has a good, sh uh, it has a short half-life, high specificity, and accurate. And it's accurate. Um, the setting in the neoadjuvant setting, one could assess response to a magnet and potentially op the op determine the optimal time to resection. In the metastatic setting, it could facilitate treatment changes in a timely fashion. So, with regards to monitoring response to therapy, prospective studies have shown that changes in levels of mutational burden detected by sequence ctDNA just has, has been shown to correlate with, again, tumor volume um, and response to treatment, and that lower levels correlate with response to treatment. Suzanne George presented um, at ESMO in 2018 
Um, she looked at, the, she reported on the CTDNA analyses performed in the Navigator trial with respect to the PGG for Alpha D842V mutant group who had received a apocrypnip in this study. And I, this is a really, I think this is quite a, a good uh, presentation that it shows something quite important for us to know. Um, firstly, the majority of patients, the CTDNA levels fell um, below the limit of detection after two months. And as we know, the majority of patients respond to therapy, and, and we would expect this. But what was important to note was that lower baseline CTDNA levels were predictive of prolonged progression-free survival. Um, whereas large reductions in CTDNA on treatment were associated with high baseline CTDNA, but were not predictive of prolonged progression-free survival. So the, it was actually the baseline CTDNA level that, um, made, that gave the most information regarding how patients did. So I think intuitively you would think that obviously a high, you would think that a higher, you know, a large reduction in CTDNA level would be also important in terms of how people would do on, on therapy. Um, so I think it just shows us that we have a lot more to learn about utilizing this methodology in this disease. Also with regards to this study, um, as, I had, as I showed earlier, CTDNA was able to be used to stratify um, patients who did well versus those who did not. And here it was able to show that um, patients responding were more likely to be negative for um, kid eggs on 13 and 14 mutations. In terms of detection of resistance to therapy, so in GIST, when we biopsy at diagnosis, we'll likely identify the dominant molecular um, clone present at the time. We then start therapy, which reduces that molecular clone. <coughs> and with time, as progression, emerge, as progression occurs and resistance emerges, we'll see other clones evolve. And on subsequent biopsy, we may detect these. But depending on where we point our, our, our needle, we will capture potentially only a few or, or maybe only one of these resistant, resistant clones. Whereas CTDNA, which is collected from blood, um, has the potential to capture all of these, um, all of these um, aberrant clones. And so this graph is just reflecting a case of a patient who had a gastric gist, um, was treated with adamantamatinib. Um, and then unfortunately developed for occurrence um, after three years on, on Mocknib, at which time they uh, went on to suit and followed by Regorafnib. Their baseline tumor tissue was analyzed using next generation sequencing and identified a number of mutations, including the dominant um, PGF alpha um, exon 14 mutation. And then with time, we um, assessed CTDNA, or we, 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 ca we collected CTDNA, and at the time of progression on regorafenib, we were able to see the emergence of a new um, resistant mutation in uh, PGF alpha exon 18. So, showing the ability of CTNA to, to capture resistant mutations and discover and essentially be a discovery tool as well. And I think if we, we at that time I think if we were aware of what we have available today, we might consider utilizing um, a if, if it was available. So in terms of um, tumor heterogeneity, just as I've explained, it, it, it is a disease where we see tumor heterogeneity, not only perhaps within, uh, within a single lesion, it can be within, many, obviously many different sites of metastasis have different, uh, will display different genomic profiles, and even within the same, within a, an isolated metastasis. And so CTDNA provides the ability to detect the large, um, you know, to, to, um, to detect, let's say, the landscape of genomic alterations within GIST, and also subsequently monitor response to each of these at a molecular level. So this is another study that was published um, recently, and I thought it was interesting, I um, wanted to show it, because basically it reflects, again, the ability of CTDNA to capture the tumor heterogeneity. It reflects the case of a large gastric gist, which was, and the patient was commenced on a matinate therapy. And after eight months of neoadjuvant therapy, there was evidence of progression. 
um, uh, which time they, they went to surgery. And at the time of surgery, their tumor was analyzed um, from a molecular standpoint, and it identified the known kid exon 11 mutation and also a secondary um, kid mutation in exon 14. Um, however, at the time, CTDNA was also collected, and this not only showed those two mutations, but it also showed three further mutations in kid exon 17 and 18. And the researchers went back to the uh, surgical specimen. They ultimately divided it up into 10 different samples and resequenced them. And by doing that, they were able to identify the, the spectrum of molecular changes that were evident in, in, in the CTDNA sample. So um, I'm going to wrap up soon, <laughs> but a few things just to take into consideration when we're developing this tool for utilizing and just some things to think about. So what clinical factors influence tumor shedding and the ability to detect CTDNA? Does the site of disease, do the sites of disease present make a difference? Will this affect tumor shedding? Whether or not the primary tumor is present or not, does that make a difference? The clinical status of the disease, if it was progressing, more like, you're likely more likely to capture CTDNA. If you have a low tumor burden, are you more likely to have false positive rates? And the, the treatment ongoing at the time of CTA, CTDNA collection, can this um, essentially affect our ability to detect um, CTDNA in, in, or in, in our patients? So these factors may influence the sensitivity of the assay used to sequence CTDNA in order to accurately detect the molecular landscape of GIST. So essentially, I feel that CTDNA is an effective tool when used in the right patient at the right time. And then, you know, economics always comes into all of this. So in terms of the short term, there will be an additional cost, you know, developing the uh, methodology to extract CTDNA, the expertise and the sequencing technology, but in the long term will likely be cost saving in that it will replace invasive tissue biopsies, um, potentially become a companion diagnostic test and therefore optimize their therapeutic selection and minimize the um, use of ineffective therapies in our patients, and then allow for better selection of patients requiring potentially adjuvant therapy. So in conclusion, CTDNA has the potential to be a blood biomarker of clinical and molecular behavior in GIST. Sequencing technology is evolving and hopefully, hopefully will continue to evolve to allow us to um, identify the optimal, most sensitive assay to use. And then routine collection of CTDNA and prospective clinical trials and just is necessary to move forward and advance this technology. And thankfully, we are seeing that in, in the most recent trials that have been conducted. And then in, integration of CTDNA into clinical trial design is important. Um, it allows us we need to determine the concordance rate between detection of the vector of the vector spectrum and just utilizing CTDNA versus tumor tissue. Um, develop sequence. CTDNA as a companion diagnostic tool, and um, utilize it as a complementary method to response, but uh, to determine response in our studies, and guide therapeutic selection in a more efficient manner. Describe the plasticity of GIST cells during the metabolic process. Identify future other mechanisms of, resi of resistance potentially, and then tracking tumor-specific subclones um, and, on, and looking at again the molecular basis of response and then identify novel therapeutic strategies ultimately to overcome these persistent mechanisms. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I know this was a hot topic last time, so does anybody have any questions? I feel like we go. <laughs> no, no, the thing is that, that in Latin America, uh, Regular DNA testing is not done because no one pays for it. Yeah. The government does not pay for it, private insurance neither. So, CTDNA will be great for us to have instead of the regular DNA testing. Uh, as, a, as a diagnostic tool or more, moreover, to choose a better, a better treatment. In most of Latin American countries, we only have access to first line, second line. Uh, so we we need our doctors to have information to choose either to go with 400 milligrams or 800 milligrams from step one. 
we don't have access to clinical trials. So uh, we need a, a, a cheap diagnostic tool in order for us to know mutations. <laughs> Do you think that this could be an answer in the near future? Um, I think I think in time, potentially, I think the main thing to note is that, let's say, the sequencing of tumor tissue from a biopsy or surgical specimen versus that utilized um, to determine CT DNA in blood, the cost is likely comparable. <laughs> so right now, I don't think it will solve your problem. Right. But I think as time goes on and, and we're making more advances, in technology, the cost will likely go down as we see with most things. Um, so I think that that's the current hurdle for you at this point in time. Okay. But I also think that we need to be very careful in terms of choosing the right assay um, because the sensitivity of your assay you need to determine what that is. And there, so there are broad assays. And then there are customized assays, and which is the best to utilize. And I think that's what we need to also determine in the future. Right. Thank you.